Hey, what's up guys? In this video, I'm gonna give you a behind the scenes look at the recent Emery album that I just mixed and specifically talking about the workflow and how I was able to mix this entire record in under 36 hours. And that's like about three hours per song. So how is this even possible? Let's dive into it. Before I get to that, um, Quick story, now I've been an Emery fan for a while. I grew up on Tooth & Nail Records, so when the opportunity came up to work with them on this record, I really wanted to make it happen. Now, problem was, it was kind of short notice. I was actually on vacation in Florida at the time when they uh, messaged me about it, but we found a way to make it work, but the time was super limited. So I had to figure out, you know, how can I mix this entire record in like a week or maybe two max, get it done by the deadline and still be happy with it. And I'm really stoked on how the mix came out, how the record came out. And like I said, on average, it took me about three hours per song to mix. So I'll talk about a little bit more specifically about what that looks like. But that does not mean that this was like a rush job or that I cut corners on anything. I mean, in fact, there's probably more automation and, you know, special processing and stuff that I don't do on every mix on this record than like anything else. And if you just look at this session, this is one of the the uh, tracks here, you know, there's tons of automation on the drums. I mean, that's pretty typical for me, but you know, there's, there's automation in plugins like this, this stuff goes deep. Um, and a lot of songs were quite a journey, but it was a lot of fun. And I was able to mix this really quickly. So how is this even possible? You know, how can you mix that quickly and still put in all this effort with automation and creativity into the mix? Well, you really need to have a system. You need to have a system and a process. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you when you sit down to mix a song or even produce a song start to finish, are you taking it step by step in an order that you're familiar with and that you know at every point along the process what's next? Or are you doing what a lot of people do? I call it sloppy session syndrome where it's just like, it's all over the place. You know, sometimes they start with the vocals, sometimes they start with the drums. Um, halfway through the mix, they reamp all the guitars or then they switch up the drum samples. Like there's no flow, there's no process. And it's tempting to think that this is like, this is the loose creative way to do it. And then if you lock into a step-by-step -step process, then you're gonna lose all the creativity and it'll just be cookie cutter. That's not the case at all. In fact, you have to have certain boundaries and kind of a, a, in order that you do things in, in order to free up the most possible creativity. And that's exactly what I was able to do on this record. So let's dive in and talk about what that process actually is. And then I'll you know show you a few parts of this session here. So. This is the first song I mix, it's called uh, Concussion. So let me just play a bit for you. So this is the first song I mixed. And in this case, I prepped the entire session myself, organized all the tracks, got everything sitting where I wanted it to, and I mixed the whole thing start to finish. That was about six hours, maybe seven. So I did that completely by myself. Finish it, checked it in the car, all that stuff, made sure I was 100% happy with it, sent it to the band, and uh, they absolutely loved it. So we knew we were going ahead with the rest of the record. And so from there, I knew that I couldn't spend, you know, six to eight hours on every song going forward. It just wasn't possible. So what I did was I found someone to assist me with this mix and his name was Kobe. He was actually one of uh, a PPS member and also a syndicate member from 2021. So I hit him up and said, hey dude, do you wanna help me prep these sessions? He was down. So what that looked like is once I was finished this first song, I made a little screen capture video, kind of like what I'm doing here. And I just walked through my process. So I said, hey dude, here was the raw tracks that I got. Here's where it ended up. Here are the things to look out for. You know, these tracks were a little hot. These ones needed to be gained up. Um, make sure you you check this issue and that issue. And I kind of just went through the high level view of what I was looking for and what kind of specific problem areas to watch out for in the tracks. And since he's a member of my programs, he kind of knows the order that I like to mix in and the order of the tracks that I like to see on the screen and all that, because that's really important to me. Like if someone else is prepping my mix, I want it delivered to me where every track has the the naming convention that I like. You know, for example, I like it to be snare top to be SN top, SN bottom. Um, I like my toms to be uh, T1, T2, T3, 
etc. I want my overheads to be in a stereo track called OH, you know, and I want them in a specific order on the screen because that way I know exactly where everything is and I don't have to think about it. I can just go and mix with my gut. So that was part of his job, putting all the tracks in order, doing any clip gaining, using this first song as a, as a session template. So for, for the next song, he would import this session template over top of it so that my drum and bass and guitar and vocal processing would be there as a starting point. Then he would also lay in the drum samples, you know, the kick and snare samples that I'm using. There were a few edits, you know, from the band session to, to mine that needed to be cleaned up. So he took care of that as well. And there were also different tracks from song to song where there's maybe synth or piano and kind of unique tracks for different songs. And he kind of just got those ready and just put them in the ballpark, maybe some quick EQ and compression on it for me to use as a starting point. So that was his job. And so that means when it got to me, everything was laid out and the mix was like 75% there because all my drum processing, drum samples, bass processing, guitar, vocals, the bones of it were there. And so for each song, I didn't have to go through that repetitive process. I could just sit down and be like, okay, here's the song. Let's listen to it a few times, get a vibe for it, and then just dive in. You know, of course, every track needs its own little flavor. Maybe the tones are a bit different or it's got some horns or it's got some synths or strings or a clean guitar. Every song's different, right? And so it just allowed me to focus on those things. What's different? What needs to be special about this song? How do I bring it out? And how do I just use automation and processing to really mix with feeling and bring the listener on a journey through the song? That's what I focused on. And that's why I was able to mix each song in about three hours, sometimes less for some of these. It turned out to be a perfect workflow because once we got that first song going in the next one, it was it was like a machine. It was like every day I would wake up and he would have another one or two sessions prepped and ready for me. I would fire those up and while I'm mixing those, he's working on prepping the next one or two songs and we just went day in, day out like that and were able to wrap it up super quick. Now that's like the big picture overview of how I mix this, this project, but down into the nitty gritty, I'll give you a quick kind of insight into my overall mixing process. Now, I always do things in the same order. That's, it's really important for me. And what I start with is the drums. So for example, on this song, let's mute the samples for now. It's awesome how you can hear the bleed of the guitars in the room. They track this mostly live off the floor. So I always start with the drums. So I'll listen to the drums as a group in solo and I'll start getting my kicks, snare, toms, everything sounding the way I want it. Then I'll bring in some parallel compression here. Then I'll start bringing in some samples. So I ended up with this kick sample here. And with the drum samples here, I'm relying fairly heavily on the live drums. I like the way they sound, um, but obviously using samples just to bring some more consistency and just fill out the tones a little bit. Likewise on snare, let me back up here. I'll bring the snare sample in. about maybe a 50 50 mix there toms i don't use any samples like basically ever i've got a way of processing these that uh, i pretty much never need to use samples we had some pretty cool room sounds here is actually from a camera mic i think now that's the room mic but then the camera mic is here And once I've got the drums about 80% where I want them, I'll bring in the bass. Then I'll bring in the main rhythm guitars.
By the way, the end section here, I duplicated these and used little Altar Boy to make a pretty sick low octave. <laughs> And once I've got the drums, bass, and guitars sitting in a good place, then I'll bring in the vocals here. Lying face down on the pavement, broken gravel under my skin. I can't recall how. And from there, it's bringing in effects, you know, vocal delays, some reverbs on the drums, usually just the snare, any other delays and, and harmonizers or whatever on guitars or background vocals. And then it's just all feel. It's just making those final tweaks to the EQ and compression, to the balance, and then I go into automation. That's really the last phase. And I'd say my mix is about 80 to 90% done before automation, but the automation is like, it's everything to me. It's like the performance. It's, it's almost like being an artist, right? And that's why having the system and the process down is so key because like I said, in this, in this album, like most of my energy was focused on that automation. And I think that that's what just brings the songs to life. It's how you create a journey. It's how you pull the listener through. It's how you make every song sound special and interesting to the fans because you're really just using automation and using tools to just pull out the interesting elements and, and draw the listener's attention to certain parts. So that's what I do pretty much last in the mix. And I'll go through starting with drums. I'll automate the overheads first. Actually, I want to dial in that high end energy, make sure it's consistent. And you can see there's often a lot here. I mean, in this song, there are stick clicks in between uh, the snare hits in the verses, had to bring those out. Did that on the overhead track. And then from there, it's just making sure that there's, you know, a lot of energy behind the crashes. So it's all about getting consistent high-end energy from the cymbals while boosting up, you know, downbeats and crashes when they need to be brought out and then other little things like you know giving more room when it's appropriate and whatever else feels right i mean i remember getting to the end of this mix and the ending section here Actually, let me back up a little bit. So right towards the end of this mix, I think I was actually in automation and I just still wasn't happy with the drums. I thought they just needed to hit a little more harder and be a little more aggressive and edgy. I threw on the Devil Lock plugin from Sound Toys at the end of my drum chain. Like I had this pretty much all dialed in. So that's why I just slapped this on the end. And I'm only using a little bit of it in the mix, but uh, if you use this, use this plugin, you know that it's pretty intense. So let's check this out. I'll mute my, my uh, parallel bus just so you can listen. That was like the little bit extra I needed to push it over the line to where I wanted it to be. So that worked killer. And then here's the drums with my crush bus. And the reason I bring that up as I'm talking about automation, because when I got to the end of this song, it needed to be even heavier, even crazier. So I added more of the mix on the decapitator there. All right, guys, so there are some little nuggets for you from this session. Um, if there's any other tracks from this record that you wanna see me dive into here on the YouTube channel, please drop a comment below. Um, I'd be happy to fire up some sessions and do another video for you. But uh, main point I wanted to make here is have a process, have a workflow. And even if you're not working with an assistant who's gonna prep stuff for you, that's totally cool. It was many years before I started doing that. Um, but even if you're doing it yourself, like something I like to do still is prep sessions like the night before and have it all mixed prep for me so that the next day when I start fresh, 
I'm not like organizing tracks and naming things and consolidating things or bouncing things down or committing to samples or anything like that. It's, it's just purely creative and being in that flow. So definitely don't fall for the lie that you've got to be all loose and free flowing and never have any process or anything in order to be creative. That's a lie in every industry across the board. All of the greats have a process. They have a workflow that works for them so they can settle in, basically get their mind out of the process and just mix completely from their gut and feel. And I was excited to share this with you because I think on this record, it was probably the most into that space that I've ever been on any mix, just in terms of not thinking about technical stuff and just purely just reacting to the music and putting my energy and focus there when I'm mixing. So hope you enjoyed this guys. Talk to you later.